the scary show is over for Statesville Prison. Yes, the haunted attraction Lockport says this is its last year. The haunted house has been around for 25 years. You only got 31 days left if you want to come out to Statesville Haunted Prison, one of the most iconic haunted houses really in all of America. It felt so much larger than life. The amount of things that were in that, that small space, it's unbelievable. You, it almost seems like a magic trick. Everything that that kind of attraction and that kind of environment could be is what Statesville was. I'm glad that I found this place because I would have been in a lot of trouble if I didn't. It's like a nice little family that I've had for the last 20 something years. How many years is this for you again then? Uh, if you don't include last year, it's 15 years. If you don't count 2020, it's 12. Lost my balance. <laughs> <laughs> We're all gonna get through it. But man, it's gonna be so hard saying goodbye to this show and all these people. I'm just waiting for it to hit me when I leave this parking lot and I'm not ready. No emotions today, Mike. No? You point that no. thing at me, you're gonna try to make me cry, I'm not gonna cry. Uh, what's going through my head right now? Oh, everything, right? You know, everything. It's, uh... It's half of my life. It's a place where I played with my friends. I got to work with Teresa. Thank you guys for all the years of dedication. Seriously, it takes a lot of heart and soul to stick this shit out. So, like, good job. Uh, Ten years of, of, of producing shows with my baby brother and 23 years of playing with him here. I got nothing. I'm the only one I think that's excited that this is the last night. I'm, I'm about to escape Statesville. I said a little bit about this before. I know that the easy emotion here to fall into is sadness uh, because this is familiar. Uh, because this has been part of our, our, our friendships, our family, our everyday. So I know this is the end of this chapter, but it is very much the beginning of our next chapter. So let's bring it in. One, two, three, what's next? Don't make me cry, old man. Yeah! Welcome, welcome, welcome! to the last night of Statesville Haunted Prison! Anytime I'd mention to someone like, oh yeah, well I, you know, October I work at Haunted Houses. And I'd be like, oh cool, where do you work? And I'd be like, oh I work at Statesville. And they'd be like, and they won't even be from the area, or they haven't even seen the show. But they've either known somebody that's seen the show, or has seen something online about the show, or even just heard random rumors about it. It was just a, a building and a farm, right? I mean, there's nothing really unique about the space or about the location besides the people that did it. The Siegel family's been on this property farming since 1909 the 40 acres that Statesville has been operating on. Statesville is less than two miles as a crow flies across the field. I remember vividly as, as a, a young child, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, uh, watching the guard go by on horseback. Very often if the guard saw us out there, he'd, he'd ride in and get off the horse and we'd offer him a cup of coffee. When I decided to open the haunted house, I thought, you know, it has to have a theme. And uh, what in life is scarier than being in prison? Statesville is owned by the Siegel family. Rightfully so. They were the ones who gave us this chance in the beginning. Paul Siegel was the one who like, theater, weirdo, oh God, here's my credit card. Theater gave me confidence where life did not. You know, where life made me feel small and insignificant, uh, theater made me 
feel like I was bigger than that. My first real experience in haunted houses was when I was in college. I was a theater student down at Southern Illinois University. All of John's friends in the theater department at SIU needed jobs once they graduated from school. And the best way to get a job in theater right out of college is to go to these festivals that they host around the country. There was one called SETC that was in Miami. And I thought, well, if this is our career, that's why we're paying tuition, uh, we should all be at this thing. We should all be auditioning and getting a professional job. Unfortunately, there was no funding. So we would be able to afford to go to these festivals. John started a haunted house in a mall in an abandoned shoe store in Carbondale, Illinois. We raised $6,000 in two weeks. It took 26 of us to Miami. And out of that 26, 23 of us got professional theater jobs because of it. All our lives were instantly changed because of a haunted house. Came home and I went to work for an events company right away that summer, uh, designing bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, corporate events, birthday parties. One of our associates that we did, like these kids' birthday parties and summer festivals, uh, I wanna say her name was Marcy Glink, very nice lady. I ended up sitting at uh, a lunch table one day uh, with Marcy Glink and with a contact of hers that she met through uh, doing some uh, farm festival stuff, uh, Paul Siegel. So he had some experience with, with takedown haunted houses. Uh, the nice thing that we had here was that we didn't have to take it down and move it. I was gonna do what I did, <laughs> which wasn't much yet, uh, on his farm. And John gets his first haunted house and he's been out of college for something like, like a week and a half. And I remember him telling me the story of like going and thinking it was a smaller space. Oh, there's the barn, ah, there's the barn. I found the barn, no problem. So I walk over to the barn, I measure that barn and I'm like, yeah, this barn is like the size of the shoe store that we did in Carbondale, this is not a problem. And the guy's like, no, 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 it's this huge pole barn over here. Um, so he was like, oh crap, what have I signed up for? We shook hands, I went to my car and I panicked. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, I had very little experience doing anything. I built four rooms in a shoe store once. But I knew I wanted to do it. So he ended up calling, you know, Justin and Pete and I and like, and, and Julie at that point, I think it was, and just like, hey, do you have time to come do this? This is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start a haunted house company. It's gonna raise money for our theater company. By the way, I'm starting a theater company. Uh, and, and all the money's gonna be raised by the haunted house company. Most of my friends said no. <laughs> and my family, <laughs> like, what are you doing? He told me he was going to build a haunted house. Okay. <laughs> but you know what they say. She said, okay, sweetie. Yeah. I love the fact that we started this business with not a lot of support, not a lot of people saying, yeah, I'd put your money on that, and that's a good bet. We were the runts of the litter, and there wasn't a lot of people putting money on the runts. We all slept on my dad's floor. I slept on the couch, and we did our first year that way. Uh, a lot of times we'd sleep in our cars because we had to make a choice. Gas money or more Mountain Dew. Gas money, more Mountain Dew. By the end, I think we had like 20 people here one night, all of us sleeping outside in the tents and in the cars, in the backs of cars, painting clown squares till six in the morning, going crazy. And uh, we got it done. Here we are at Cottonwoods Farm. It's October 1998 and we came out to see the Statesville Haunted House. I can tell you about opening night. We're running around, bees buzzing around the hive. I'm getting all my pre-show stuff ready. And, and I had my brother, my brother's a drummer. So I put a, a set of drums up on a deck, on a platform. Uh, and I just told my brother, man, just, just play a rhythm all night, man. Just give my whole haunted house a live rhythm. And he had a buddy that was also coming in the drum, because I guess doing that for five straight hours is not the best idea. I'm calling places. <clears throat> and I climb up the deck and I get up to where the drummer is keeping rhythm, but there's no rhythm. There's no sound, nothing's happening. I'm looking around, I'm like, where'd he go? And I see two people standing at the edge of the deck looking down, eight feet down. And I'm like, what are you guys looking at? And they're like, the drummer. I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, John, he was at the drums and he leaned back in his chair and he went right through the plastic wall and fell eight feet that way. 
And so I run to the wall, I look down below the plastic, and there's just a broken half wall down there, which means this man fell, landed on that wall, and smashed it. And I'm like, good God, where is he? Where is he? And then we hear a voice, hey guys, what are you looking at? And it's the drummer. He's standing up on the deck, and we're like, Jesus, Mike, what, what happened? What did you, they said you fell, and, and he goes, yeah, John, I, I was leaning back, and I went through the wall. You should probably put a railing back here. Tough guy, decided to do the show anyway. Show starts. Um, doing my rounds, doing my rounds. I get to the, the morgue, a uh, little scene where my buddy Danny Joe runs out with a saw uh, and does this. Ah, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Danny Joe, you know, does not run out. And there's Danny Joe on the ground with blood coming everywhere. And I'm pretty sure I see a part of his skull. And that's not good. And it takes me a good eight minutes maybe to realize those aren't his brains. He went to the store on the way and bought one of those Vucci appliances and glued it on himself. And I had no idea that he gave himself his own prosthetic. It looked very convincing and it sent me into a panic. Nevertheless, he was still unconscious. Uh, so the paramedics still had to put him on a board and take him out because he had a head injury. As the ambulance is leaving with Danny Joe in it, another ambulance pulls up and we tell him, no, you're good guys. Uh, they already got him, everybody's good. Uh, where they inform us, they didn't get called for him. They got called for someone that was working for Paul that was out in the cornfield that just got ran over by a hayride wagon. I remember sitting at the end of that night in the barn by myself talking on a corn cob phone, because uh, I guess that's what farmers use in their barns, uh, with the hospital. Um, just wanting to know if Danny Joe was going to be okay. And as I sat there on hold waiting, I just kept asking myself, what did you get yourself into? There was a coin flip right there as to whether I was coming back the next day uh, or whether I was gonna write this off as a terrible, terrible idea. The first couple of years were politely a cluster f The clown experience of the late 90s includes a few toxic elements. Strobe lights, Justin DiGiacomo's sound design, which, if played in a professional studio, would be disturbing. I take farm junk, like a big barrel, and mount it above the wall and place my speaker inside it. You know, if I flip the speaker around, how does it rattle the wall when I play low end through it? So the clown room experience of the late 90s was, I'm jumping, I'm scaring you, I'm making silly voices and creepy faces. And then once an hour, I'm taking four more Advil and violently vomiting out in a cornfield just outside. 30 minutes to clown room! We did not have a tent. We did not have heaters. We did not have indoor plumbing or sink. When you sneezed and blew your nose, it was black. Even starting your day, waking up at noon, finish the cast list, get some food into you, get the supplies, get on site by four. Start the show. Sometimes it ends at 1, sometimes it ends at 2 a.m. I remember Kyle having no choice because he was nine, and so I could just pick him up and carry him here. So my first involvement, I was an actor uh, in the Maniac Ward. So I was the original Maniac. Um, so I would sit back there with one of my cousins, or uh, I think my sister Sarah, and I'd flail around, and I'd get there at you know, four o'clock right after school and I'd stay there right until my bedtime. I would go up and down the line and I would go up to, uh, to families and say, hey, my mommy doesn't have enough money, can you um, buy me a ticket? She's standing outside, she doesn't have enough money for both of us. And I'd actually join with their family and you know, hang out with the mom of the group. And we go through the entire haunted house and there's one specific scene where the clown would drag me through the wall and pry me away from uh, the family. So one specific one was really bad. Um, the clown was dragging me through and the mom was holding on to me really tight. And the clown is now dragging me and the mom through the entire haunted house while John was laughing his ass off. That was the funniest thing in the world. John ended up finding a house that we could all live in. The Boogie Nights house. The 70s porn house with the bright orange uh, shag carpeting and, and mirrors on every surface. <laughs> I don't know what they did with it before we got there, but I expect it was porn and cocaine. I lived in the family room that was downstairs that happened to have mirrors on the ceiling. <laughs> you think it's sexy time when you're like got mirrors on the ceiling, but when you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning seeing your face for the first moment of the day is not that great. <laughs> We lived together and we worked together and 
it's the only way we can function, but we also live together and we work together and it can drive us all a little crazy. It was an extension of, of college, really, because we all kind of like clanned up in college and sort of created this community of friends and it was just an extension of that. I mean, and how awesome to come home every day and like you sit down at a, a fun big table with your best friends and talk theater at that point. Who wants cow tickets? and John started a tradition of every night we would get home and we count the tickets. Like, I hate it, because it's like you're tired and you just want to have a drink, you know, but it, then it, but it became this thing of like, look how much we did. Like, look at the physical numbers of how many people, this is why we're tired, because we did 3,000 people tonight, you know, like, and, and just watching that grow became, was so impressive. That's great. That's awesome. That's great. From an economic perspective, man, we were just packing them through there. There was one day where we looked in the parking lot and the audience went to the back where that cornfield was and it wrapped around to the left and they were talking about parking problems. This is what we're doing now and, and we're good at it. At that time, the landscape, the haunted attraction landscape, was, was still very heavily influenced uh, by nonprofit, by JCs, uh, by lower budget productions. Almost every haunt you went through was, this is the swamp scene, and this is the Freddy Krueger room, and this is the graveyard scene, and it was a bunch of interconnected rooms that had nothing to do with each other. This was themed from start to finish. It wasn't just stand in this quiet line and let's go to this haunted attraction and then when we're done, we're done. The moment you got out of your car, it was like you were going to a rock show. HauntedHouseChicago.com and HauntedHouse.com proudly present the best haunts from the Great Lakes region to Statesville Haunted Prison. <laughs> But there was something happening, a duality happening, where like everything I loved about creativity and storytelling was working. Who gave you the alien mask? An alien in the graveyard? <laughs> and on this side, all the numbers and the math. I was watching all of that just peak. We had conquered the business part of show business. But it just got bigger. The ceilings got bigger. The staff and the casts got larger. John opened uh, City of the Dead, which was totally his brainchild. Two haunted houses at one location. Now you've got twice the attraction, a totally different experience. Red light. Okay, green light. I used to go to Statesville to come up with ideas to steal for my show. I actually went through the show like four times one year to try and figure out the math of how this worked. You need to see it how the audience sees it. Don't just do what's cool in your head. You need to take a moment and think about what the audience sees. Our designs, year after year after year, would get fine-tuned to taking up every square inch and letting the audience believe that it's bigger and it's stronger and it's more powerful than it actually is. It's just a bunch of theater sets and a farm building. John has always said that we, we uh, entertain by the square inch instead of by the square foot. Getting it so that people felt like well, they weren't quite so sure whether that attraction was gonna, gonna get them. You know, we took this kind of idea of haunted houses, which back then, uh, we call them the, the museum design, where you walk through dark hallways, and there's a half wall, and on the other side of the half wall is where the scene is. You're safe. The scene's on the other side of the half wall. Statesville removed that half wall. They wanted to make sure that you were fully immersed in this entire show and there was no back corner that you were going to hide from the monsters being on that side and the patrons being on this side. I wanted people to feel that they were inside the horror movie, not just watching it. They're willing to drag you outside and beat you if you act like a jackass! The whole thing was so... aggro. I want to right up here, let's go! I'd never been in such an angry haunted house. <laughs> For coming, you maggot burning hell. Get the hell out of here. It wasn't about going to a spooky place and hearing wind and ghosts and the trees. Like it was about coming to a place that was just laying down the beat. Whether it was blazing speakers and rock music, actors shooting off propane guns. Once you got on the property, you were being watched and they were gonna find you. <laughs> there is just something animalistic that gets brought out. This different level of, 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 of aggression and rage that they're able to channel. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy! 
to the pit! Can you describe the experience of being in the pit at Statesville? No. <laughs> Welcome to Statesville Haunted Prison Opening Night! Ain't nothing like a Statesville pit. It is just different. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? It completely empowers everyone that's in that room. It makes them something more than a small little kid jumping around. It makes them part of something that's just amazing. What are my big I come from like a stupid family, you know, like, but like I come here and I feel totally accepted. It gave uh, places for, for, for kids to go that, you know, don't play sports or aren't, don't play musical instruments or are in the theater. The, the kids that are way, they're on the fringe. Just hearing the screaming from little preppy girls the first night, I was in. I was hooked. <laughs> Because <laughs> those are the kind of girls that used to make fun of me. I was a real putz kid in high school. Always, you know, getting into fights, getting in trouble, getting suspended. I had just gotten into high school and they had put me in behavior disorder. I was just on a really bad trail. I really liked drugs. I was really loud, really mean. And I managed to meet Craig Bodeker. And uh, if you've ever talked to Craig, he brings up the haunted house. We all love it here. It's a great place to work, great people. We all love it and uh, I decided it would be a good thing for me to try out. It's, it's Halloween night here at Statesville. What the hell is wrong with you guys? It's Halloween night here at Statesville. And we'll, we'll feed, feed the, the beast. beast. Everybody was so nice. 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 The managers were so nice. The other actors were so nice. Helped me figure out like what I was going to do because I had never acted before. So they really helped me not make a fool of myself, even though it's, you know, that's what we're all here to do. I went home and I was like, this is, I could do this forever. Between that and everybody else that I've met and skills that I've picked up here, I feel like I've just overall become a better person than I would have. This year's John Leadership Award goes to Chunks. Yeah! Statesville is the darkest, dirtiest place I've ever been in my life. And somehow, it's just warm as could be. You brought me from a little baby boy into this place and you've turned me into a man. And I cannot thank you enough. Thank you. And here's the baby of the family. You're not like a baby. By any means, it's okay. So I went to school, I study construction management and architectural technology. So during that time, that's what I kind of figured I was going to do. Uh, and then the market crashed in 2008. So there was nobody really hiring for people like me. Um, so it kind of took a turn where John was in a situation where he said, hey, I can use your skills on our job site and uh, I'll pay you a little bit of money this summer. And if you could do it until you get your, a job for yourself, you could do it. I don't like that up there. <laughs> it's Kyle and I have been friends since grade school. Um, and I walked through and said, the audio at Statesville is terrible. I ended up working the following season at Statesville. We uh, eventually started redoing a lot of sound effects, whether it was on props or actual room sounds. I worked directly with or under Mike Gimlick. At the time, we called him the professor because he has got years and years into this set building and design industry that I had no knowledge of. How did you get elevated to your position of sort of like being the grand pooba, the professor uh, <laughs> over there? I know how to read. However you want to do it, <laughs> do it. Just don't go throwing shit up and popping shit in the ground. That's all I'm saying. Made it five times as hard so they can finish it. Where the hell's Kyle? Why, what is wrong with that crazy shit? I just kind of kept going at it and kept, um, kept thriving at it. John would say, hey, this is the project. What do you want to do on it? And I just kept moving up and moving up until I'm here now. Everything that Zamir does is what I want to do. I think it's the greatest shop in the world. My parents' haunted house had uh, just finished. I was a stilt walker, so I had this stilt costume and everything. I'm like, kind of still want to do this. And sure enough, Statesville was the closest place to my house. A kid had brought a stuffed animal with him, and in line gave me the stuffed animal, in which I ripped it in half <laughs> in front of him and the uh, fluff went everywhere. The kid bawled his eyes out, and uh, 
I felt horrible. One of the other front of house guys said, way to go, Fluffy. And the name stuck. And I absolutely hated it. <laughs> I didn't understand why uh, haunted houses didn't have trailers like movies. Uh, why when you looked at a haunted house online or went to their website, it was just, you know, their driving directions. <laughs> we really paired everything with a camera to be able to tell our story. And all of that led to Days of the Living Dead. Now we have a web series that follows us around all year long, whether it's me doing pencil sketches, trying to figure out what we're gonna do, or going to conventions, or throwing huge parties, or training the actors, or running the show. Days of the Living Dead is following the zombie army year round now. There were kids at home watching and saying, I wanna do that. I wanna do that with those people. Days of the Living Dead, I'm a part of the generation that like, that's what drew me to Statesville. I would go home from school and I would watch every single episode, like just constantly. I had to work there. I saw the energy and the environment and I saw how this crew worked together from days and seeing all of that come to life in a real show absolutely blew my mind. One day I am going to go and I'm going to work there. And then I saw the work call and I was like, I have nobody to go with. And my dad's like, who cares? Just go. And there's actors in there that weren't even born when this started, and they are now carrying the torch. And I found so many other weirdos like me. I found people that were weirder than me. I found people that made me look normal, and I was like, oh, okay, this is where I belong. During school, I'd be like, I can't wait to go to Statesville later. I can't wait to go to Statesville on Thursday. I can't wait to go to Statesville on Friday. I felt like I belonged for the first time in my life. Expect that you're going to meet the best people in your life, because obviously I have, and you're going to have the best times of your life. I learned that I can manage people and I could be a support system for people. I'm so proud of the stuff that I learned being a part of something so big. This ain't enough. This is fun. This is a great goddamn time that we get to do this. But what's next? I've had one person, I've had a thousand people ask me, why would you give this up? Why would you, why would you stop doing, you know, a show that you, you gotta be making lots of money? Yes, it was very good to John and I. I'm in my 60s. When we started this, I was in my 30s. And uh, your life's perspective changes. All things come to an end. And, and our time on the Seagulls Cottonwood Farm had come to an end. We got to celebrate this final year and, and most haunted houses don't get that. You know, most haunted houses don't know it's their final show until after. 23 years I learned here. 23 years I've laughed with my friends here. 23 years I've suffered here. <laughs> and 23 years I have succeeded here. But this place is not about this weirdo. Because the moment everyone else said yes, it was no longer about me and my weird ideas. It was about all of us choosing to do this together. It hit me like a, like a truck of emotion of how lucky I am that I've had all these people behind me for all these years pushing forward, following me into this madness. There's something very heavy about that. You know, about someone saying they're going to follow you. Uh, there's a responsibility that comes with that. Uh, it was not one I planned for, but it, it's one that happened, and I am a better human being for it. So are you ready for the future? Hell yeah! Are you ready for the future? Hell yeah! Are you ready for tonight? Hell yeah! Then what are you going to do? Attack! What are you going to do? Attack! Then one last time, let's go feast the peace!
Good to see you again. Hey! What's up, guys? They can't even cover on the case. Where are you going? You're in the t-shirt booth. There's nothing here. It's great that we got to have this last year to celebrate it all. I mean, look at this. We're real lucky for that. I've grown a lot by just watching other people grow and find their home within this like fun misfit gathering <laughs> and and just watching them like evolve and chase their dreams and feel support and find friendships that they probably would never have found without Statesville. Over the years, over 23 years that we were that that staple in this in the whole state of people to do something with their families. You can't explain it. It's the most amazing feeling in the world. And I have been blessed to be able to do it with some of the most talented people in the country. Um, I will miss it dearly. We went out there as kids. And uh, that's where we turned into adults. <laughs> yeah, I guess that meant a lot, huh? <laughs> Let's go! Come on, babies! I am so proud of all of the kids that I got to teach and work with. And anyone who had ever even listened to me for the slightest bit, I am thankful. Because all I, all I wanted was attention my whole childhood. And then I realized all I wanted to do was make sure that those kids had something like that. That happiness. You gotta let it happen. I know, it's hard. But you gotta let it happen. I don't want it. <laughs> Thank you, everybody! Thank you, thank you, thank you! Thank you, Statesville, for all these memories! Thank you, all you wonderful people! Thank you, single family! All right, let's go cry a lot and eat some food! Thank you, everybody! And good night. I'm gonna miss it. Statesville has been a part of me. It always will be a part of me, and I'm sad that it's gone, but I'm really proud of and glad of what it did to me and to anybody that's ever seen it or worked for it as well. I'm gonna forever be grateful that I stumbled into this madhouse. <laughs> <laughs>